from where you sit. Well, welcome to another episode of The Trading Bell. This week, we're talking about the banking industry and we are at the IM Bank here in Nairobi and we'll be speaking to the Chief Executive Officer, Kihara Maina, on what trends we are seeing in the banking sector. But really, who is Kihara Maina? Let's now take a look at his profile. Kihara Maina joined IM Bank as the Chief Executive Officer and Board Member in May 2016. He holds a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Moore University and an executive MBA from the University of Chicago, both School of Business. Miner began his banking career in June 1993 at Stanbic Bank Kenya, then moved to Barclays Bank in 1997, where he served extensively over the years, ultimately taking up senior leadership positions. Prior to joining IM Bank, Kihara was the managing director of Barclays Bank, Tanzania. Well, many thanks for joining us for this conversation around the banking sector. I'm now joined by Kihara Maina, the CEO for i and Bank. Many thanks for making time for us. Thank you. Well, uh, you've been at the helm of the bank for nearly two years, and these two years have been uh, preceded by a very turbulent time in the financial sector. Let's just pick it up from how has the impact of the rate cap been for i and Bank, and is there some hope now that you're seeing uh, the government changing its stance, saying that uh, they'll be making amendments? Well, I think overall for the banking sector, the interest rate caps uh, were quite uh, impactful. And they led to quite a number of uh, changes that perhaps uh, some were good, some were not so good. Um, I think earnings have certainly been depressed. We've seen returns on equity drop for the, the, the industry. We are not uh, immune to this. We've seen um, a, a shift in focus when yeah. it comes to who is getting credit. So credit access has suddenly been constrained. And similarly, we have also seen um, a shift to quality, if you like, uh, when it comes to lending. So sectors have seen uh, themselves being locked out of, of the credit markets. Um, and at the time it happened, you are already seeing um, a decline in credit that was actually being provided to the, uh, the private sector. Mm -hmm. So this deepened it as well. So uh, the challenge is that we are probably seeing uh, some significant uh, decline in economic growth as a result. We don't know how, how impactful this is going to be, but certainly it has um, slowed the pace at which we would have been able to grow the economy. Mm -hmm. And um, for banks, you've also seen a, a, a recalibration. People are looking at uh, different things uh, to generate uh, revenue streams. You've seen a greater focus on service-led income. We certainly have, have uh, driven that, uh, that particular line. All right. And uh, Kiara, before we talk about uh, diversification in terms of revenue lines, uh, of course the central bank has been uh, very categorical, saying that uh, the rate cap is just one among the many factors that has sort of led to a dip in uh, lending in the Kenyan economy. Of course, this has also been influenced by other market fundamentals where we had a prolonged election as well as a depressed rainfall. And this sort of had a uh, sort of a chain event when it comes to overall lending in the markets. And uh, from where you sit, uh, how, how valid is this uh, narrative? Yes, so they are correct that uh, we had already seen the dip in, in uh, credit uh, to the private sector. It started actually way back in 2015. But what we feel is that, and you will see the research that has come from the, the KBA, but what we feel is that the interest rate cap has actually lengthened the period of recovery that you normally have <coughs> for any decline in, in the credit to the private sector. So we have to um, uh, agree that um, as a policy change, it wasn't something that was uh, well-timed, let's say. And um, as a result, it has led to uh, an the unintended consequences that we had talked about mm -hmm. as an industry and had warned against, they have come to pass. And um, it is not, uh, you know, collusion as, uh, as some quarters would like to talk about. Uh, Price fixing. Uh, exactly. <laughs> no, we actually have a very competitive banking sector. All and right. you will see that um, pricing for customers is, is, is actually very competitive. 
Now, we do appreciate that structurally there have been challenges that have led to significant uh, uh, pricing when it comes to, to banks, to customers. And uh, we have talked um, at length about uh, addressing some of these structural issues. We can't, for example, expect that you're going to get slow uh, you know, justice and that then you're not going to see that being reflected in pricing because at the end of the day, that is capital that is not working. How do we make sure that we can prepare people to uh, better use credit? And you've seen some of the initiatives then that uh, the KBA has put out, um, uh, providing training, providing now commitment by banks to actually provide um, you know, concessionary pricing where needed to uh, the SME space. So there are lots of these conversations happening, but we need uh, reciprocation as well from right. a lot of different quarters to say, well, we're going to also take the feedback from the banking sector and address these issues. Interesting. And uh, one thing that uh, many Kenyans, of course, are asking uh, Mr. Kihara is, as much as we're seeing the rate gap, banks are still reporting profits at the end of the day. So it's quite ironical. But moving away from that, uh, as a bank, uh, walk us through the numbers, really, in terms of uh, what has been uh, the biggest growth area for I&M Bank. Of course, I know you've been doing a lot of uh, diversification and coming up with new channels for delivery, especially to the fast-evolving clientele. Yes. So, well, let me first address the issue of, of um, what are perceived to be outsized returns by banks. Actually, yes. So we do get big numbers being mm -hmm. uh, reported by banks. Yeah. But what people fail to link that to is the amount of capital that's actually being deployed to be able to get those returns. Yeah. So when you look at uh, earnings that are in the billions and you look at returns on equity that are now uh, averaging somewhere around the 15% uh, mark for, for the sector, maybe even slightly lower, we'll wait to see the results you can see that you need a significant amount of capital to be able to uh, generate even 1 billion shillings, right? So the returns on equity are not actually outsized. In fact, they, in a lot of quarters, we are getting concerns from commentators saying, well, why are they depressed? And even at the pre-cap um, the pre uh, um, you know, period, period yeah. We still saw uh, returns on equity that perhaps were not uh, what you'd say outsized in the um, early 20s if you're, if you're lucky. And you expect to see, especially in economies like ours, you expect people to show returns of that kind. And uh, Kihara, you sit in a very strategic position, not only by being in the financial sector, but really looking at the developments we are seeing, especially with the digital disruption, Gone are the days where clients would walk in into banking halls, queue, then withdraw cash or deposit a check or simply just withdraw cash. Mm -hmm. Nowadays you're seeing uh, it's a battle for convenience where people at most would really go to the ATM if it comes to accessing their financial uh, products. And uh, as a bank, how have you been able to stay afloat even with this uh, massive digital wave that we are seeing across the country um, sort of changing the model where we used to have the brick and mortar banks. Banks would pride themselves, chest thumb say we have mm. 100 branches across the country, we are opening our 101 branch. Mm. What has been the story for your bank? Well, first of all, let me say that uh, the banking sector as a whole has always been a very early adopter of technology. Uh, secondly, technology should always be viewed from the standpoint of how it actually helps uh, humanity. You want to be able to get more effective at uh, what you do. You want to spend time on the things that are really more uh, you know, important to you. And technology does that. It helps free up time and makes uh, it convenient for our customers to actually do their banking. So we have embraced that at i &M. We have understood that Yes, a network of uh, branches is important. Sure. Th that cannot be gainsaid. There's still you that farmer who wants to see important. a physical bank. Precisely. And um, you actually need to be closer to your customers as mm. well. Mm. If you are out in, in um, uh, Nanyuki, for example, sure. and um, you know the nearest place you can get a branch then is, is uh, Nyeri, that's going to be quite a tall order to, to actually make that access. So you want to get closer right, to, uh, to, to your clients. But technology enables you to do that in, in quite a number of ways. Mm -hmm. So 
the ATMs, for example, were uh, a very big introduction into, into the market. We ourselves have a network of about 58 ATMs. Uh, they're important because we are still uh, heavily dependent on cash in our economy. Yeah. And we need to be able to provide uh, access points for, for cash. It helps us to reduce the burden at the branch by providing automated uh, telling services. Uh, but we want to go beyond that and say, what else can an ATM do? So that you're not just simply withdrawing cash. Maybe you can deposit cash. Maybe mm -hmm. you can transact at the ATM and you know, move money around and so on buy your utility, uh, you know, make your utility payments and so on. That we need to find more and more uses for, for ATMs. But uh, more broadly speaking, the advent of the digital um, technologies has meant that we now truly have a way to get closer to our customers because suddenly you're working just simply from your office to be able to do all your banking services. We need to enable that. We need to make sure that people feel comfortable and safe actually using these uh, technologies. So uh, we have to train people uh, who may not be as digital savvy on what benefits make it as easy and intuitive to use uh, as well. So this is what we have been doing at, at INM. We have embraced it. We have set up uh, a digital factory we call iCube. Awesome. And the idea is to really think through a lot of the different changes that we need to make to ensure that our customers' lives are truly made easier. All right. And uh, so talking about this uh, digital disruption, um, how much have you put in as a bank? And uh, of course, uh, having a digital factory is not something you hear every day from the banking community. And uh, talk to us about the size of the investment. As also give us uh, your closing remarks, really, around uh, where you see the, the banking industry heading and uh, what are some of the low-hanging fruits when it comes to customer conversion, and of course, growing the business at the end of the day, making the balance sheets look much neater. Mm -hmm. So I think the way to address that is to really talk about um, what our thinking in terms of strategy is. First of all, we really truly are just focused on how we can get closer to our customers. How can we make sure that we're truly customer centric? To that end, we know that we've got a lot of partners that we uh, want to work with, and indeed in our purpose, we say that we want to be partners of growth for all our stakeholders. So thinking through those lines, we then have devised a strategy we call Imara, which really just focuses on uh, how do we actually improve <coughs> connectivity with our clients? Sure. How do we make sure that we are actually designing products and services that are suitable for them? And um, we believe that that is going to drive the kind of penetration in our chosen market segments. We know we can't be the bank for everybody. We have to select who we are going to serve so that we can serve them well. And we have done that. We've created customer value propositions that speak to the segments that we want to, uh, to address. We are looking at our regional presence because our, our clients, um, especially in the corporate space, are increasingly looking at the regional markets, so we want to make sure we deepen our regional market presence. Mm -hmm. And we want the quality of our earnings, obviously, to, uh, to improve. So we are focusing on making sure that we are truly uh, understanding our clients and their needs and making sure that uh, the different sets of services that we provide truly speak to the needs that they have. All right. And it would be unfair for me to close this interview without asking you about the bank insurance which uh, is a critical area for banks right now as they try to, of course, diversify their business. Uh, for you, in, in closing, I just want to get uh, your quick comments on this. Well, so this is an important part of our business and we started our bank assurance business about three years ago. It has grown very well in the intervening period, just actually this year, we've closed on, a, on the purchase of a brokerage. Um, this was the UJ's uh, insurance brokers. Sure. And um, that has gone very well. The idea behind that is that we want to deepen the range of services that we actually provide in bank insurance. So it's not just simply, um, you know, off the shelf stuff that you can pick up and, and, uh, and sell. We're also thinking solutions. So that's what really what we were looking at uh, over there. This is bringing in the kind of brokerage experience that will help us to design solutions for our, particularly our corporate clients. All right. Interesting conversations there. We really look forward to the regional expansion. Are you looking at Ethiopia, perhaps? Well, when they open up. <laughs> All right. When they open up. 
Many thanks there, Kihara Maina, Chief Executive Officer at INDM Bank, just giving us uh, the lowdown, really, on what's been happening in the financial sector. And it's quite bullish that uh, the regional market presents a host of opportunities for the industry, despite the rate cap still being in force, which is expected to be lifted sometime in the month of September. Well, that's where uh, we bring it to a close on our interview segment for this week.